How's everyone going? It was good for Din's, was it? I didn't get out there, but Mary got me a nice salad. We got a live salad this morning, so that was good. And before I answer any questions, I just want to do a few things. Um, firstly, tomorrow um, morning, if there's any mediums who would like to do some uh, work with some spirits, it won't be a public session, but it will just be with mediums that we might record. Um, if they could contact, come up and see me about it after, um, because I'm happy to be here from 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, uh, or might make it 10.30 actually. <laughs> and, uh, and we can do a little bit of uh, mediumship, because there are quite a lot of spirits who have been lining up to talk, and if you feel comfortable with doing some of that with me, then I'd be happy to do that. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is, remember so far, we've talked so far about these two things, truth and willingness, uh, with regard to protection from spirits. Now, I can't, I can't say to you so strongly enough how important those two things are in working your way through different issues with regard to spirit uh, influence. Every single time you even get out of your own personal truth, you are going to be influenced by spirits, right? Every single time. So, so let's say inside of me, I actually have an emotion inside of me, and I'll, I'll just say as an example, because I don't have this emotion, but I'll just give you a few examples. Let's say I have an example, emotion inside of me that every pretty woman that is around me, I would like to have a sexual relationship with. Let's say that's the emotion. Now, I could, in a spiritual state, go and actually be celibate in that state. Right? Where I could actually live a life of celibacy, even though I have this desire inside of me that I would like to um, have sex with every pretty woman that's around me. Right? Now, can you see that my life of celibacy, although I'm living it, is not a reality at the soul level? Can you see that? Because I have this feeling in my soul that I would like to you know, be with every pretty woman, right? So, so if I'm not in the state where I recognise the truth of that, I am so easily able to be manipulated. Can you see that? just by me not recognising the truth, my own personal truth, that that's what I desire. And a lot of times I find that's not so much an issue as the desire that many of us have to be angry. And we'll talk about this as a separate issue because spirits hook into this uh, in major ways. But many of us have a desire to be angry. Now the reason why we have them is many fold. A lot of times it's because we feel like other people did us damage and we're not to blame for it, they are to blame for it, and they should fix it, not us. Does that make sense? So we have a lot, we have a lot of projections or expectations that other people to fix things. And so in the end, we really want to be angry rather than actually deal with the underlying grief. And our desire to be angry, we often are not truthful about. You see, on the spiritual path, when you're angry, what are you looked at? What, what, how do people look at you? Oh, you know, you're not very spiritual if you're angry, right? So what they do, what you finish up doing if you're on the spiritual path often, is you suppress all of the rage and anger that's there inside of you. You completely lock it down. And you make out, even to yourself, that you're not angry, right? And, it's a, and you can do this really easily. To, to be frank, particularly if you become detuned or you go out of body a lot, um, you can detune very much from your true emotional state. And, and so what, what I'm doing at that moment is I'm telling myself, no, I'm not angry and I don't desire to be angry. Now, if you're not truthful with yourself, you're never going to get to a causal emotion for a start. Right? But secondly, any spirit now can hook into your rage at any point in time and manipulate it. Right? And they can do this over and over and over again. And we act in a manner that we feel is not angry, but actually is very angry as a result. Now, I've seen this happen over and over and over with so-called spiritual people who are looked up at by everyone else. 
Like a lot of people um, who are in a state where you know they're treated like a spiritual guru are actually quite often very, very angry, but in a very suppressed state. And they, they have relinquished all their desires, they say, including the desire to be angry. And the problem with it is that they're not speaking the truth. And whenever you're not speaking the truth to yourself, of course a lot of spirits are going to help you not speak the truth to yourself as well and to others and they'll just hook into that. I just don't want to answer questions just yet. So that is one area of the issue of anger I want to deal with separately because it is a big issue with regard to spirits. But can you see how whenever we don't face the personal truth, if we don't face a personal truth, whatever that personal truth is, now we're able to be manipulated. Right. So um, I'll give an example of what happened with myself and Mary a few weeks ago and I think I may have mentioned this before but who knows. Um, what happened was we were driving along in a car and Mary was starting to get really angry with me, right? really upset and angry with me. And then she, then she noticed that she didn't really feel that angry but she was verbalising all this angry stuff right, at me. right? And, uh, and she realised that right at that moment that she had a group of spirits around her who, who were angry with men and I was a good target. Right? So here's, here's the person on earth who was in the, rage with me, in the rage with a man. So I'm the man, right? In the rage with a man. That's pretty obvious. I shouldn't write that there, should I? <laughs> Superfluous. And, uh, and so... She was in a rage with me, but not understanding actually that there was this group of spirits around her, women spirits, who were actually in a rage with me. They were really, really angry with me. And what they were doing was they were using her to express their rage to me. Does that make sense? And she didn't even feel it was her rage even in the end. She didn't feel that angry with me. She just realised she was saying a heap of things that she didn't even really believe herself. Right. So then we had to look at, all right, well, why would this group of spirits be able to actually influence her in this manner to, to express their rage to me? And that's when she came face to face with the hook, the hook she had to the spirits, which was to do with pleasing women. A woman pleasing other women. Many of you ladies and many of you men with the same gender, the men, have the same injury. This is how it works. When I please the women in the audience and I'm a woman, now all of those women can connect to me and they can project all of these loving emotions at me and they are in agreement with me and I feel really, really good because they are in agreement with me. If I'm a woman and I then disagree with that group of women, now not only is their emotion triggered of what the disagreement's about but also there's a second emotion triggered and that is we're not women sticking together. We're not women all having the same viewpoint towards men. We're not loyal to each other. So there's this emotion of disloyalty towards the gender. Does that make sense? Now many men have the same thing of course. Where, where a group of men will get together and if one man says, oh, I don't feel that way about my wife, then he's like hammered because he's now disloyal to the gender. Now, when we feel a feeling that we've got to maintain loyalty to our gender, we're actually now allowing the whole of that gender in the spirit world to manipulate us in any which way they can. Right? And that includes if they're angry with a man and I'm not really angry with a man but they are, their influence can, by my wanting to please their women, I can then be influenced through that process. So can you see how if we see the truth of what the hook is, we can start seeing what's going on. In reality, the emotion that Mary wasn't dealing with at the problem was her desire to please women even if they were being unloving. Can you see that? So while she's expressing all this anger to me, to the man, it may appear that the problem is that she's angry with men. But actually that's not the problem. The problem is that she's unwilling to deal with the emotion, or she was unwilling at that moment, to deal with the emotion of why she needed to please the women. Does that make sense? 
And this is where it's very difficult sometimes when we're in this interaction spiritually, is because often we think, oh, I'm, I'm, angry with women, I'm angry with men, so I must have all of these spirits around me who are angry with men. Well, while that is true, because that is our law of attraction, we're not understanding what our hook is into those spirits influencing us. And our hook is often totally different to the actual emotion we're expressing at the time. Do, do you get that? The hook is totally different than the emotion at the time. Monica, you want to comment? Um, if we use a mic. Yeah. Just wondering, how on earth do you work the night then without, because I tend to overanalyze things anyway. Um, how do you get to that space if you really want to stay with the emotion or like get into it without getting too intellectual about it? How do you actually deal with the emotion? Yeah. Well, no, how do you work out what the hook is? All right. Because I thought it was um, whatever emotion you were avoiding that, that they would hook into. So that's what I've been concentrating on. And well, it was an emotion Mary was avoiding, which was the emotion to please women. Does that make sense? She was avoiding that emotion. Yeah. And because of that emotion, these women, she wanted to please these women, and that meant even doing what they felt, what they felt she should do. But did she think it was to do with the anger one, though? That's what I'm saying, because I, I tend to lump all the angry women ones in the we're all angry at men basket. <laughs> and I'm just wondering then, so how do you take it a level further and work out what the hook is? Well, what, what I do myself is I go firstly, well, I'm angry, so I'm out of harmony. <laughs> So I'm angry, so I'm out of harmony with love and truth. That's the first thing. And this is probably the next subject that I want to discuss with you. If I'm angry, I'm out of harmony with love and truth. Simple as that. Now, if I allow myself to speak out all this anger and rage at a person, I am very much out of harmony with love and truth at that moment. Right? And I am going to open myself up to spirits speaking their anger and everything as well through me. Does that make sense? So, so at some point I've got to take stock and say, hang on a sec, I'm angry with men myself, not them, myself. I'm angry with men. That is part of the issue. Right? But then I've also got to ask just one question in addition to that. And that is, why am I willing to express the rage and anger of a spirit towards these men? In other words, why am I willing to do what I'm told <laughs> by people who are in worse condition than myself? That's really what the question we've got to ask ourselves. You see this happening in a group all the time where you know, you're all sitting around for dinner. You're all sitting around for dinner and all of a sudden one person comes in who's in a really angry place or whatever. Can you feel the mood of everyone? Like, the mood, you don't have to say a word. The mood just goes, whoa. Like everyone's, everyone's now afraid of triggering that person's rage. Can you see that? So what is that person really doing? They are controlling you with their rage without saying a word. That's what they're doing. They're controlling every statement now that comes out of your mouth. Now, we had this happen in our trip uh, over to, the, to New Zealand. We were sitting down at, uh, at Karen's place and, and we were in a group. There, this was after the group had finished. This is Karen. Karen, can you just stand up, Karen, so they know who you're talking about? That's all right. That's Karen. And Karen's got this lovely place in New Zealand and we were staying there for a little while at her invitation. And, and what happened is we had a group there and, uh, and, and then um, the group finished and most of the people went home and a couple stayed overnight and then left the next day. And, and then that night, we, myself and a few others who were left were talking about some spiritual matters and all of a sudden one of Karen's friends comes who who was invited to come the day before. But she didn't come the day before. She came actually when she thought she could avoid me the most, which was, she thought I'd be gone by then, right? So, so she came hoping that I wouldn't still be there. Right? So that's the emotion I get from her the minute she sees me. Like she sees me and goes, the feeling in her is just like, oh no, like. <laughs> I was hoping that he'd be gone by now. Like, so that was the feeling in her. Because of that, she felt quite a lot of anger that I hadn't gone, that I, that, I, that I was still there. And she walks in and sits down to a meal that had been prepared for her. Now, at that moment, everyone sitting at the table 
felt an emotion from her. Right? She didn't say anything. Everyone said hello, she said hello, you know, all the polite stuff goes on, right? And she didn't say anything, but everyone felt an emotion from her. And the reactions of each person sitting there were very different to that emotion. Um, Mary was sitting next to me and her reaction was, AJ's now got to stop talking about anything. <laughs> and it wasn't towards the person that came to visit, it was towards me. Like, so in other words, Mary's feeling was, I don't want you talking about any spiritual things in front of this woman. So that, that, was, that was Mary's emotion. Now straight away what had happened in that moment is Mary's condition was lowered to the person with... So in other words, she was allowing the person in the resistive condition to dominate her life more than desi her desire to actually talk about spiritual matters. Does that make sense? And then a few of the others went quiet for a little while, like, you know, just went quiet. What do we do now? Like, uh, you know how, how you have that feeling? This person's not going to like what we're talking about. Do I still open my mouth and talk about it or what do I do? Now, the instant we have that feeling, we're actually now in danger of not acting in harmony with our desires anymore, right? What we're doing now is we're acting in harmony with the desire of the person who is actually projecting the rage and anger at me. Then I'm acting in harmony with their desire. That's the purpose of anger when you think about it, isn't it? Why else would you do it unless it's to control? Right? So this is the issue we face with spirits. Oftentimes we have a group of spirits surrounding us who are in a rage. But they're very nice to us as long as we toe the line, just like a person on earth would be. And you know this from any of you who have experienced abusive relationships with a partner, right? The person is nice to you as long as everything that they want to have happen happens how they want it. As soon as it doesn't happen how they want it, they're now angry with you. Right? And I'm not saying that they just sit down and have a chat with you. I'm saying they're in a rage with you. They'll say all these nasty things at you and everything, right? Project it. And the reason why is because these people are with you to control you. That's the whole purpose. Why would you be with a person on earth unless it's to control them? What's the point of a spirit being with you unless it's to actually get something out of it? Unless they're a person who loves you and just wants to help you in any way. Now many of these spirits actually believe they're helping. So that group of spirits who were with Mary believed that they are helping Mary. Right? Mary's had a pretty hard history with regard to men. And when I say a pretty hard history, um, if I describe some of the events from the first century, most of you ladies would be absolutely horrified about what happened to her. Right? So she's had some very, very difficult events from the first century about men. Now that emotion inside of her connects her to these other spirits who have also had very, very similar events and history with men. Does that make sense? So that's a connection. But on top of that, Mary has had this other emotion from the first century about women. Many women in the first century treated Mary terribly. They treated her like she was the whore, the prostitute the, and all those kind of things and they treated her very badly. Often it was the women who actually treated her worse than the men in terms of their projections, in terms of talking to her, shame, trying to shame her and all of those other things, right? So of course there's going to be an emotion there of wanting to please the women, wanting to make the women feel good so that, so that she doesn't get these projections. And these women were just hooking into that emotionally. Now what that means is then that they could then express their rage through the process at the man. Now, if I'm in a state where I don't, I, I can feel my anger rise inside of me, but I realise I'm out of harmony with love when I have this anger, so I've now got to own this anger and just go away and not express it at somebody. Because the moment I express it at somebody, I am now hooking into the entire process of what the spirits also want. Can you see? If every time I felt this anger rise inside of me towards men, for example, 
I decided I wasn't going to express it at a man, but instead I was going to get a punching bag, and bang, 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 and own the emotion of anger inside of me. Can you see that takes away the power of the spirits who are influencing you? Can you see that? Straight away, well, they're going, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. I want you to be angry at the man, you know, <laughs> not at the bag, <laughs> or owning it within yourself, you see? And this is why many, many of us, when we're angry, we don't want to go away and own it. We want to stay where we are and project it as heavily as we can at the person who we're projecting it at, right? That's what we want. And the reason why we want to do that is because it, it feels inside of us that it gives us a voice for it, but in reality it's one of the most damaging things we can do and it's also one of the things that spirits hook into the most. Because if you can, you can either choose to work along with these spirits or to act out of harmony with them. It's up to you. That's a choice that's inside of you. My suggestion is never act in harmony with what a spirit wants you to do. <laughs> right? Now how do I know what a spirit wants me to do? Well, any spirit obviously who wants me to do something that's good is okay to act in no. harmony with, obviously. But how do I know when it's not that kind of a spirit? Quite, quite easily, really. If I'm in a rage or in anger, then I'm, I know straight away. I'm pulling in straight away lots of different spirits who are going to be way out of harmony with love in that place. I know that straight away. Anything I do from that moment on, justified or not, is out of harmony with love. Everything I do from that moment on is out of harmony with love. Right? If I don't allow these spirits to have a voice for their anger, then straight away, and I don't mean by me not owning it, I mean by me going and privately feeling the rage instead of publicly or with a person doing it, that's owning it for myself. If I publicly express it or express it towards a person, now I am not in a place where I'm anger at all and I'm now in a place where I'm actually very under the control of any person in the spirit world who wants to express that anger through me. That, that makes sense to you? So, so when I'm in this space, I now give them a voice. So now a lot of what's coming out of me is not even mine. Right? And you've all been in this place at some point where you said a bunch of things to somebody in a rage and then go, whoa, where did that come from? Yeah, where did it come from? <laughs> It come from a group of spirits with you who wanted to express all those things that to that person because they have all those emotions. You are certainly connected to those feelings but you've got to look at where it's come from. The fact is you gave those spirits a voice. right? Stop giving them a voice. They need to own their own emotion. You need to own yours. When you own yours by going and bashing a bag or whatever, now they don't get the voice they wanted. They don't get the means to express it to the male that they hate. Does that make sense? They don't get the means to express it to the mother they dislike or any of those things. They actually now have all of their power in the interaction is now taken away from them. Can we just go over to there and then back, uh, back there? When, when you say something and you're projecting anger and you don't actually remember what you've said, after the fact? Yeah. That's often not your own words? Of course. Okay. <laughs> Why? Well, you definitely remember what you've said, wouldn't you, if it came from you? And there's only been one time in my life where I felt so angry that I couldn't see the person I was angry at yep. anymore. I was almost blind rage is the only way I could describe it. Yep. That spirit influence as well? well? Of course, but remember... Every one of these things is a hook. We've got a hook into them. Yeah. We've got a reason why we're doing this with them. Okay. Right? And a lot of times the reason why we're doing it is not because of the anger. That's what I was just illustrating here. The reason why Mary was doing it was, wasn't because of the anger. It was because of her fear of displeasing women. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, yeah. so if she didn't do it, what would all these women do to her? You know what they did with her for the next 45 minutes? They just projected rage at her because she refused to project rage at me. Huh? I can see why you'd want to avoid that. <laughs> okay, so you can see why you'd want to avoid it. So if you feel that and you start wanting to project rage at the man again, then that makes everything better. 
It doesn't make everything better, it just makes your soul condition worse as well, but we often feel it does because we get relief from the spirit world. So if you can think of a lot of the spirits who are in a malevolent condition, they, they use, you know, the whole, the, whole, the whole thing, the carrot and the stick, right? You know how that works, don't you? Right? You get the carrot when you do the right thing, you get the stick when you do the wrong thing. Any spirit who does that with you, out of harmony with love. Right? So if you feel relief when you do the wrong thing, you know you've got a group of spirits around you who are totally out of harmony with love. And if you feel pressure when you're doing the right thing, you beauty. I know I've got a lot of spirits around me out of harmony with love and doing the right thing is just challenging them full on. <laughs> and we're allowed to. This is a spiritual warfare you are in. And when I say a spiritual warfare, this is a, this is a battle for your soul that you're in, to be frank. Do you understand that? The battle is for your soul, you. You to be your own self, your own individual, your own desires, your own wants, your own, your own feelings being expressed every single moment. That's the battle. And every time you hook into them, you are no longer yourself anymore. You are now being someone somebody else wants you to be. That is now out of harmony with love and truth of yourself for a start. But straight away you've lost the battle. Can you see that? Like We're in a battle for ourselves, for our own soul to be be to be honest, truthful, loving all the time. And we need to understand that that's where we're at. We could, right at the back, wasn't it? Yeah. Right up. Uh, two questions. If I'm bashing the um, punching bag and screaming and still thinking of the person that I've just been standing in front of, I'm still hooking in and the spirits can still hook into me. Exactly. Okay, so I've got to just really try and blank off and just come no, from I've myself. Got, I've got to own the rage yeah. that's within me towards me, toward my childhood rage. Okay. Or the expectation. Remember um, last weekend I talked to you about expectations and addictions. Every single time an expectation in you isn't met, you will get into anger if you don't have a desire to get what's underneath. Does that make sense? So, so if, I'm in a, if I have an expectation of another person, so let's say at the moment I've got an expectation of Sven, right? Sven's the camera man just there. Like, so I've got an expectation of him. I'm going to get angry every time he doesn't meet my expectation. Right? Now I've got to see that what's actually causing my rage isn't some childhood thing about men, uh, sorry, a childhood rage about men. It's actually because I want to control men. <laughs> I want to get a man to do what I want. And that probably came from my child where I was either got nothing that I wanted or everything I wanted, one of the two, which is both as damaging as each other, right? And what happened was I, I've grown up now to think that my way of getting what I want out of a man is just to get angry with him. Once I'm angry with him, now he'll either do what I want or I'll get rid of him out of my life. So, so if I concentrate on it and say, God help me to own this and get into the causal underneath it, yeah, so then that will keep me in there and not projecting it out. So own the rage and really own the rage. without there's a, You'll feel a difference when you do it. When you're projecting at another you're not owning the rage. right? You're not feeling the rage pass through you. You're feeling the rage pass out of you and into the other person, and you like it. We like it, that's why we do it, <laughs> right? So here I am, I'm in a rage, right? I'm, not so sure someone, this one either. I'm in a rage, let's say, at a person, so I'm in a rage at this person. I want to be, I'm not owning the fact that I want to be, right? When I really want to feel my rage towards women, in this case, because that's a woman I'm in a rage with, when I really want to feel my rage towards women, it will pass through me, not to her. So what, what you find happen is that you can feel it inside when somebody does this. You can be with a person talking to them and feel that they're in a rage with you, and then all of a sudden they own their own rage inside of themselves, right? And now you don't even feel the projection of rage. They are screaming and yelling, but you're not feeling it hammer you anymore. And if you're sensitive to it, you'll feel the difference between those two states. 
And you'll also eventually feel the difference between those two states inside of yourself. When I own my own rage, I don't want to have a voice to somebody else with it. I just feel it, feel it, feel it in me. And ironically, when I'm in that state, very, very rapidly I get to the underlying terror or grief. Like for myself, it's usually a minute. Like, let, well now I don't get into rage very often, but if I do, it's usually one minute. One minute and I'm crying. It doesn't last very long at all. Can I just ask something else? When you were talking about um, the willingness to deal with it, yep. if I'm not willing because I'm not getting into it, can I pray to God to help me have the willingness to um, get into the causal emotion? Well, I, I suppose you can pray to God about anything, can't you? But, but if I'm not willing, I, I can certainly ask God to help me be willing, but am I being honest with myself? Like, if I'm not willing, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be more appropriate to pray to God about why I'm not willing? Okay. I knew like, there was something that I was missing there. So that's what, why am I not willing? And yeah. show me that. Yeah, and then show me that. the law of attraction will help me to get into that. Because God's not going to make you willing. Because <laughs> it's your free will that makes you willing. God's not going to make you willing. Yeah. What God's going to do is expose to you the reasons why you're not willing. Yes, God will yeah, certainly that, do that. That's more or less what I was getting at. Yep. If I ask him to help me become willing, then through my law of attraction, he will help me to... No. No, I have to ask, why am I not willing? <laughs> yes. And then the law of attraction will kick in. Yes, because, because let, let's be specific. If I, if I know I'm not willing, how can a prayer to God asking him to make me willing actually make me willing. Like, like firstly, he can't answer the prayer because it's out of harmony with love. And how is he going to answer the prayer? Only by showing me why, why I'm not willing anyway. I've got to be open to the why. Yeah. Like, if you're angry, you've got to be open to why you're angry. Like, firstly, you've got to be open to the fact that you are angry. <laughs> and then you've got to be open to the fact of why you're angry. If I'm not willing, I've got to... Like, so many people come up to me at the front and say, oh, I really want to deal with this. Is it happening right now? No. Then you don't. So many people say, but I do. I said, no, you don't. Is it happening right now? No. Then you don't. But I do. You know, you keep getting the same answer back every time. The truth is, a lot of the times, we just don't want to face the truth. <coughs> On the divine love path, you're going to have to face the truth. That includes facing the, that includes facing the truth. You don't want to do it. Right? and be honest about the fact that you don't want to do it, and then ask yourself, if you want to go deeper, ask yourself, why? And you'll be surprised what comes up with the why. There's lots of terrors and fears and lots of stuff, shame, and all sorts of reasons why I don't want to do it. Can you see the difference? Yeah. Yep. So whenever you feel like, oh, all right, I'm not staying in truth, instead of asking God to help you stay in truth, say to yourself, I don't want to stay in truth. I don't want to. Why? Oh, because if I stay in truth with that person, they're probably, going to, they're probably going to write me off for the rest of my life. If I stay in truth with that person, you know, if I stay in truth with that person, I'll lose half of my income. If I stay in truth with that person, like, I'll have to leave her and, you know, she'll take half of my livelihood away. If I stay in that, you know what I mean? We have all these emotional reasons why we don't want to stay in truth. But if I don't say to myself firstly, I don't want to stay in truth, I'll never acknowledge the why. And the why is all of the business. Like that's the, that's the emotional business. That's the processing we need to do, the why. So, so this is where it's so important to be honest with yourself. Like when you say to me, when you say to me, I really want to deal with this, but I can't seem to get there. What's going to be my answer? Standard. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't really want to deal with this. And the reason why you're getting there is because you don't really, you're not getting there is because you don't really want to. Let's be honest. Then the question is, do you want to know why? Why don't you want to deal with that? Why don't you want to deal with this? Why is a pretty good little question, isn't it? Let's just put it up there. For why is this? Why is so good? So, I don't want to stay in truth in my personal relationships. I don't want to stay in truth with regard to how I act with people. Why? 
I don't want to be willing. I don't want to deal with my emotions at all. I'm sick of dealing. I'm sick of hearing AJ talk about it. That's why I, half the time I don't want to go to one of these sessions, you know, even though they're free. How many, how many times have you felt now, up to now, that you'd really like to not come? <laughs> many of you are not being honest. Because there's plenty of times where you haven't felt that. And the reason is because oftentimes you get presented with some more truth and there's a deep unwillingness to actually deal with that inside of ourselves, right? And we're not willing to ask ourselves why. What we, what we want to do is have some magic cure, you know? Like, and I've told you that I can't give you a magic cure and the truth is actually that God can't either because these emotions are within you. So even though I'm talking about the divine love entering your soul and helping you through this process of growth, that's not a magic cure for you holding on to negative emotions. Your holding on to negative emotions is totally dependent upon yourself. That's it. Nobody else. It's totally dependent on what's going on inside of yourself. The question you've got to ask yourself is, why do I want to do that? So a lot of people have said to me, oh, you know, I'm not progressing very well. So um, what was that machine that you were talking to me about, um, Jen? What? What was that machine that you were... Yeah. What was the machine you were talking to me about? What's it called? So this was a question I was asked in the break. Oh, that's all right. She'll get it there. Yeah, I've got it written down. Thank you. Sorry about this, Jen, putting on your spot, waking you up like that. It's no good, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting law of attraction there, that was. <laughs> I just singled you out of the audience there. <laughs> and put you in a fluster as well now, hey? <laughs> it's um, Omega Wand. Omega a, Wand. A magnetic hematite wand. Right, a magnetic hematite wand. Okay. So the question I was asked was in the great was, is a hematic hematite, or whatever it is, wand. And. Uh, <laughs> And how helpful is that going to be for my spiritual growth? That was the question. And what I did was I just drew this diagram. I just said, that's what? My physical body. That's what? My spirit body. And this is my soul. And what's the one going to affect? One of these two things, isn't it? Isn't it? So, so sure, if you want to affect one of those two things, go ahead and do it. But if you're on the divine love path, why would you choose to affect one of those two things when you've got total control over your soul? Why would you choose that if you're on a divine love path? The reason why you're doing it is because you're not getting where you want to be and you think one of these other things. So there's an actual emotion, a reason of why you're choosing to get a device. So there's a device that comes into my life. I think I should do that. The device doesn't address the issue as to why my emotions aren't already flowing in my soul. Right? And it may force them to flow or whatever, but it doesn't change the fact that I've got a resistance to them flowing. That if all the device does, and by the way, the device, the technique, the, the you know, process or whatever else you want to call these things that, that people will present to you, all they do is try to avoid the blockage you have. Now, on the divine love path, what's the best thing to do? Cause and effect. Deal with the cause. What's the reason why my emotion isn't flowing? Because I've got a block to it flowing. A, a wand might help me, but do you think it's going to help me very long? I don't think so. While I've got that block, it's going to flick back into the same place, is it not? Right? So I'm not dealing with the cause. Now, I know these things. I know them. I've been taught them over and over again whenever you've come to, the, to these sessions. But hardly any of us trust that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Because we don't believe that. They say, but, but such and such had a good, you know, good, good, they had a good response to that. And such and such had a good response to that. And we quote 20 other people that had a good response to that. But we're talking here about the divine love path, are we not? The divine love path is all about becoming connected to God in such a way that you become at one with God, is it not? As a byproduct of that, all of your other stuff will be resolved. But it's a byproduct. 
of that, right? Now, if I'm focused on resolving these other stuff in my physical body, my spirit body, and so forth, and I'm not doing my soul work, am I going to become at one with God? No. And you can use device after device after device after device, and you're still not going to become at one with God because we have emotional blockages about becoming at one with God. Simple as that. And we need to deal with them. And all the device does is help you circumvent the truth. The truth is, well, I need that device so that I can feel good, so that I can feel like I'm pro progressing. Because the truth is that I don't feel like I'm progressing and I'm angry with God and I'm <clears throat> frustrated with this entire thing that AJ's teaching me and I'm sick to death of hearing about emotion. I want an alternative. <laughs> I want something else, you know, to, to deal with stuff. I don't want to have to do it this way. And what have I said from the beginning? There is only one way to at one with God. And many of you still don't believe that. And that's okay, you don't have to, but I'm saying the truth to you. There is only one way to at one with God. And that is through dealing with your causal emotions, right? And having desires that are harmonious with love and truth. That's the only way you can get there. And devices are not going to help you get there. Do you think God looked at the device like, did the device, was the device around 100 years ago? The, the thing I say to myself whenever I'm presented with any of these things is this. All right, 2,000 years ago, what did I do? Oh, yeah, well, I didn't use a magnetic resonance device and I didn't use this device and I didn't use that device, right? I had to deal with my stuff, right? And then I, then I look back 20,000 or 30,000 or 50,000 years ago and where, where mankind didn't have a lot of these devices, do you think God created you in such a way that you need a device to connect to God? Does that make sense to you at all in a logical way? It doesn't, does it? Okay, so this brings me to the next point, and that is this. Something to remember when you're dealing with spirits. Divine truth is logical. One of the reasons why there's almost as many men in this audience as there are women is because divine truth appeals to the logic as well as to the emotion. Do you understand? Right? When you go to any other place where you get all this metaphysical mumbo-jumbo, like, <clears throat> and to be frank, a lot of it's not mumbo-jumbo, a lot of it is metaphysical truth. But it doesn't make much logical sense in many cases. And the truth is, many times there is no logic to it. Right? And many times there's gross distortions in logic. And the reason why well, is the divine truth is logical. Like God gave you a mind, of course. The mind is an expression of your soul's emotions, but the mind is capable of thinking. Okay, so stop giving away your thoughts to spirits. <laughs> do you know how we do that? Like, yeah, you've all done that at some point, giving away your thought to a spirit. Like, uh, here's one. I have doubts... about whatever. We could put in here, law of attraction. Right? In other words, I don't believe the law of attraction really exists, you know, like AJ is saying. Now, you can easily in that state give your mind away. Because anybody who basically then te teaches you that there is no such thing as a law of attraction, that it's all to do with like just good people, bad people, or, and there's no really rhyme or reason to it or whatever they come up with as a theory. What will actually happen is that while you have the doubts, you are now allowing any person around you to influence you one way or the other, aren't you? You're like a swinging pole, like, you know, like if there's such a thing, um, right? Just somebody swinging back and forward, back and forward, back and forward, back and forward between two different opinions. There's a good scripture in the Bible that talks about that actually. But now that I've brought out the Bible, a lot of you have trouble with that as well. But the Bible, the Bible says um, that a person who limps on two different opinions is like a wave being driven by the sea. In the it just has no direction in many cases, right? And it just gets driven where the wind blows. Can you see humanity doing that? Yep. Now, now when, you, when you notice yourself doing that, 
That's, that's the issue. We notice ourselves doing that. Now, logic can help us get out of that process. Obviously, if I'm just going with the crowd on this issue and then going with the crowd on this issue and going with the crowd on this issue, I may as well just give up free will altogether, right? Because that's what I've done. And I'm just going with the crowd. Right? So I might as well just sit down and write down all the things the crowd wants me to do and just go and do that. Right? But that's not going to ever connect you with it, or yourself for that matter. It's far better to have some logic here and say, all right, I've got some doubts about the law of attraction. What's a practical thing I could do to deal with the law of attraction? Experiment. One month. I'll give it one month of experimenting with regard to my emotional law of attraction. All right? So I'll experiment. Not this, in this intellectual try, 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 nothing works. I mean to actually work my way through one emotion that I know that I have inside of me at the causal level and deal with that emotion and notice how that affects my law of attraction. Now, once I've done that once, just once, right, I will have less doubt about the law of attraction, will I not? Because I will know whether it actually works or it doesn't work. I'll know whether it's related to an emotion or not. Once I have less doubts, then I can start, being, I can even have more logic in this process, can't I? And I can say, all right, let's do this month another one. We'll just see how another one goes. Now, in the end, absolutely everything I've ever taught you, right, which in actual fact is not my truth anyway, but you don't have to believe that, but everything I've ever taught you can all be proven by your own experimentation. Now, many of you have done the experiment, started to do the experiments, right? Many of you are still fence-sitting a little and not really experimenting. Many of you have a sole suspicion that what I'm saying is true, but you're not really sure how to put it into practice and so forth. My suggestion is use some of the logic that you have and stop allowing spirits to hook into your emotions about it all. You see, the way a spirit would hook into your emotion about that is let's say... Um, Today, somebody comes along and yells and screams at you. Now, many of us would be tempted to do one of two things, wouldn't we? One thing we'd be tempted to do would be to yell and scream back. Right? That doesn't work very well, though. So another thing that we're often tempted to do is just withdraw from the person completely. We usually take one of those two actions, do we not? So we've... Got that person out of our lives, that's great, let's go on to the next thing. Now that's what the spirits would like you to do. What does the law of attraction want you to do? The law of attraction wants you to actually work your way through why you attracted this angry person of that gender being upset and angry with you right now. That's what the law of attraction wants you to do. You can experiment with that. But the spirits don't want you to do that because they can feel this rage in you of it all being unfair rise up in you and this rage about it all being unjust rising up inside of you. And what do they want? They feel it's all unfair and unjust too. So what do they want? They want to hook into that. They want to actually now manipulate that into something else, into putting you into a rage or feeling it's all unfair, I'm going to give up and all those things. You see, they want to now manipulate your doubts rather than you actually building on the logic of what you've already learned. That's what they want to do. My suggestion to you is that truth is always logical and if it's not making any logical sense, then you need to have a good look at whether it's making any sense at all. Right? So things need to make logical sense with truth. And a spirit doesn't want you to be logical, generally. And I'm talking about spirits who are in terrible emotional conditions. They don't want you to be logical. They want you to just express your rage and express your anger and express all these other emotions so that they can. Right? If we have a mic over here, can you... Um, Hey Joe, I had a um, couple of last week, I think, with um, I was in a position of being um, feeling very um, unfairly treated um, and all those sort of emotions. Yeah. And uh, it was with Graham, and he was um, 
And I really was angry. Yep. And the more he stood there, the more angrier I got yep. until he left. And I suddenly had this complete feeling of joy. And then I just sort of felt it for five minutes or so. And I picked up an axe and I chopped the tree in half. Yep. And then I really felt better after doing that. Yep. But that was... The jo I've never felt joy before after anger. But would that be a, a spirit influence? Certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do you feel when you're in a state where you've just controlled somebody yeah. and you really wanted to? You feel like, wow, this is a powerful place. This is why we get addicted to the emotion, you see. It's a powerful place. It feels great. It feels great to get what you want. <laughs> you know, that's what we feel as a child often. We feel, if the only time we ever felt happy was when we got what we want, right? And so we're often acting that out. And spirits with us feel exactly the same. So they th they they are just reinforcing that the angry place is the better place to be. Mm. Does that make sense? That's yeah. all they're doing there. For a couple of weeks there, you were quite angry, right, about yes. some things that I yes. said, right? Yeah. And and remember, well, not just you, but yeah. well, yeah. yeah. And remember, the anger is always the vehicle by which you're now allowing spirits to connect to you and express a lot of their stuff as well. Anger never helps you get deeper unless you're fully in your own rage and not projecting at anyone else, yeah. ever. Well, yeah, well after, I, after the tree came in half, it was already dead anyway. Yeah. <laughs> just to let everyone case yeah. there was a motion about that. He slaughtered a lot of trees <laughs> with this guy. Um, <laughs> I'll yeah. misrepresent him again. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go on. Yeah, and, and, but after that, I, I really could feel what was happening then, you know, after I dealt with the, the anger properly. Yes, and, and let's look at it at its causal level. Obviously, there's some dad stuff here. Yeah, father, and, that, and that's the first time ever in my life I've realised I had father issues. Exactly. Because I yeah. was relating everything to my mother yep. that, I, that now I, I believe I've dealt with some of it anyway, if yeah. not all of it. Yeah. Um, and, and, of course, I had all these other things happening to my right-hand side, getting stung, getting big lumps of wood in my foot and all yeah. these things. And I, it, the sort of light bulb... God's just going... I'm telling you the truth, I'm telling yeah. you the truth, I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. Oh, you're not listening, you're not listening. Oh. <laughs> That's it. And it keeps coming up and bashing yeah. me and, and then eventually you just get there, eh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's often how it does happen. Yeah. We often are totally oblivious to the truth and then when we come a, become aware of what's really going on. Yeah. But until that time, our spi you know, spirits even in dark condition can easily hook yeah. into our stuff. And obviously there was a spirit around you who, f who felt about a dad issue as well. Mm and then felt this great happiness at being out of control, the dad figure, yeah. do you know what I mean? And obviously, for the spirit, maybe Graham uh, um, was a person who was very similar to his dad, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like, and so he felt a real strong... Yeah, it's because I, I can always remember, because like with my mother, I, I was, I, my unworthiness with my mother was always being suppressed, but with my father, I can always remember arguing and, and trying to get my desires that way. And of course, that's what Graham was doing to me. Was yep. With this this bargy bargy going on. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And the key the key is for both to work through it emotionally. The 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 truth is every time you get into that place. So as soon as I heard, and I heard it around about way. Well, actually, no, I heard it because you emailed me actually, didn't you? Expressing some of your rage in a byproduct with me, right? <laughs> that's what you were doing. And and uh, and a lot of people, by the way, do that. They they they. CC me into their argy bargy with someone else, right? <laughs> and <laughs> sure, sure you can, but you need to turn on the mic. <laughs> By that, um, yeah, I, I just thought you were abandoned in the, the sanctuary. Really, that's that's that was my anger with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's not true, but it's a feeling no. you have. And and uh, but but you didn't state that to me. No, no. No, I was so you weren't even honest in well, your feelings with me about yeah, well, that. Yeah. Well, again, c going further on from that, I was I was going to send you an email uh, about that particular issue afterwards. But of course, once I dealt with the anger, yeah. it, it, it didn't exist anymore. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's the beauty of the emotional yeah. stuff. Eh? You know, after a while, we go, "Whoa, that was a bit silly. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that anymore." And that's really good. Yeah. That's a good indication that you know you you are getting to the bottom yeah. of some of those emotions. The, the key to remember is that whenever we want to project our anger at the other person, we are actually in a place of avoiding the underlying emotion. Mm. So, so, 
this anger issue is really important to address. If you want to have protection from spirits, you need to learn to not project your anger at other people or yourself. Now, it's very important that you understand the second part, or yourself. See, many spirits hook into you hurting yourself. There are many spirits in the spirit past because of them hurting themselves. And uh, I'm going in and out again. There is, does that make sense? Like there are many who have suicided, purposefully died because they were in a rage with something and they are often still in a rage, right, with other people. And so they, they just search the earth for people who are angry with themselves. And what they do is they connect with that person and they'll cause you to do all sorts of things out of the rage with yourself, right? Now, many people who go on big promiscuous uh, tr you know, trips in the sense of like they don't really care who they sleep with and what goes on sexually in their lives, many of them are being influenced by these kind of spirits. Because when you don't care about yourself and your own feeling and your own emotions, you will often do many damaging things from spirits who don't care about you either. Right? So we need to learn to care about ourselves and don't project anger at others or ourselves. Owning the anger inside of you is far different than projecting the anger at, towards yourself. Now, when you feel, you'll feel like projecting anger at yourself when you start, and when you start hitting yourself and things like that, that is now just acting out how other people have been angry with you and that you feel you're to blame for that. Right? And you need to get under the emotion of anger towards yourself and into the grief about yourself. So for example, if you feel angry about yourself because of how you look, that is really grief about how you look. Does that make sense? It's not anger at all, it's, it's grief really. And your anger is your avoidance of how bad you feel you look. It's the underlying emotion that we need to get at. Now, Whenever a spirit notices you in a state of rage, and by the way, it's really easy in the spirit world to notice because you have all this stuff coming out of you, like ready, ready brown, like arrows going out of you everywhere, and in particular towards the people you're angry with. They receive those, right? Now, from a spirit perspective, he sees you projecting anger, or she sees you projecting anger, and if she or he feels the same kind of anger, they're in business, right, with you at that point. Now there are so many people on the divine love, who were on the divine love path who have left the divine love path because of their rage towards myself. And many of you and know of them, right? Now, why have they left it? Well, in the end, the main reason why is because we're not humble enough to feel our own emotions in the end. And we want to blame or we want to, do, we want to be angry instead. Right? This desire to be angry is a major problem on the planet, if you think about it. Why is there this constant stuff going on in the Middle East? One person gets hurt, their child dies. So they then want to hurt the other person so that their child dies. So that they can feel the same emotion they're feeling. In other, or it would be more appropriate to say so that they can feel the same emotion they're not feeling. Right? They're avoiding. You see, oftentimes what happens is there's one person here who felt hurt by an event. Whether it was just or unjust is immaterial. Right? They feel hurt by the event and so what they want to do is hurt the person who hurt them. Right? Why do we do that? Because we're angry. Why are we angry? Because we don't want to feel our grief. It's the only reason why. 
And so this person doesn't want to feel their grief, they want to attack this person so that this person has some grief now. Does this work? Never. You know, one illustration in the Conversations of God book was, you know, the one person gets out a, you know, their hand and slaps them across the face. The other person gets out a, you know, a knife and tries to knife them. The other person gets out a machine gun and blows them away. You know, it's like, and this is what it's like. And eventually it escalates into even countries getting out bombs and blowing away hundreds or thousands of people or the potentiality of even blowing away millions of people at once, all from this emotion of rage. Right. Are we going to have to learn how to deal with our rage? Yes. If we want to progress towards God, we're definitely going to have to learn to deal with our rage. And the way to deal with our rage is to not get in a rage with ourselves or others. You can still feel the rage without projecting it at something or someone or yourself. And you will notice the difference when you do that. Um. AJ, before when you were talking about, um, you know, when we're, we've got the willingness and, and the protection is able to come in, in what form does the protection come from God and... Well, firstly, when we're willing, our, our, our Father can provide us with this protection that we, temporarily that we need from these spirits, right? And obviously prayer is a factor in that. Or a desire, remember, a longing coming from you. So when you have a longing to work directed towards God and you're willing to deal with your emotion, now God can actually afford a temporary project protection around you from spirits who are harmful. So does that mean... Because I sort of swing from one side to the other with the spirits, because can't it be a good thing because we can actually... It, it can... Um, the emotions that we're being denied, that we're denying, actually be enhanced, so we have more of an opportunity to feel them, or if we're willing, yeah, okay. of course. But oftentimes we're not willing. That's why it's happening. So what you're saying is very true. If we're willing, the spirit attraction is very beneficial to us, and if we're willing, we can easily process through the emotion. And ironically, most of the time we don't don't then want God to protect us because now we're yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking. If we've got this protection, then we don't we don't have any spirit influence, which I guess I'm feeling might um, simmer down our emotions a little bit. If no, no, see, see, God never changes your law of attraction still. Okay. Right, so you're still going to get law of attraction events, obviously. But if there's a willing... Many of you have you seen this, right? When there's a willingness inside of you to deal with a certain issue, you notice how your law of attraction ramps up on the issue? Have you noticed that? Like, you, be, you can be igno ignorant of the issue for months and months and months and then all of a sudden you're willing to deal with the issue and then all of a sudden in one week you get five different things happen that trigger you that emotion. You notice that? That's because your willingness has now stepped up a notch. Right? So have those events always been there, but just because we're willing to look at that yeah. issue then there? Yeah, and a lot of times you can detune emotions um, and avoid the emotion um, as a way, see, a lot, we oftentimes need law of attraction events to deal with an emotion, right? Otherwise, we might not deal with the emotion. And so, when we step up a notch on our soul and we have a desire to deal with the emotion, often the law of attraction ramps up as a result of that. When we have a desire to suppress the emotion, then our law of attraction will also respond to that. So, we'll, have a, we'll, we'll actually, and, and our own desire will respond to that too. We'll avoid situations that could trigger that emotion, for example. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if, I, if I've got an emotion with my mother to deal with, right, and I don't want to deal with it, the best thing to do is avoid my mother or do whatever my mother wants. And before that point in time, that's what I will do. As soon as I get a willingness to deal with an emotion towards my mother, I will now stop avoiding my mother and I'll now stop doing whatever she wants, which is definitely going to bring up the issue. Can you see the difference? Yeah. And often it's these shifts in us that cause the law of attraction to ramp up. Yeah. So with the spirit influence then, like you were talking about before with the anger particularly, mm -hmm. if we just own it straight away... Yep, you then will, it will never harm you. So we don't need protection from spirits if we're prepared to own it in every single circumstance. Spot on, we don't. Okay. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and remember that's what I'm saying, is these, these are the protections... I think you're thinking them, uh, of them a bit differently than I am. And I think most of you are doing this. The way I view these things 
are intrinsically they are the protections, not externally. Um, and, and I'm not really getting that across to everyone. So let's have a look at how I can. When you're in a state of truth, you are intrinsically now in a place where spirits cannot influence you or make you compromise automatically. So that's a protection. Can you see that? It's not like a big surrounding field around you. The protection is the fact that you're now in the truth of every moment and stating the truth in every moment. So now no spirit can influence you with, their sh with your shame or your guilt or any of the other emotions that would cause you to avoid truth or your fear of punishment or your fear of pain or any of those things. Because you're in a state of truth, no matter what, now no spirit can influence you in that particular regard. That's now a protection for you. It's not actually a wall around you. It's actually intrinsically now inside of you, you've created a protection in you that you cannot be influenced by a spirit now in that regard. Does that make sense? Yeah. Where, when I become willing, what happens is, when I'm willing to deal with an emotion, now this emotion now is going to pass through me rather than being projected from me. Now that is intrinsically a protection because now my own emotions are passing through me. Firstly, there is no law of compensation events affecting me because I'm not damaging other people anymore with that emotion. And secondly, now that it's passing through me, I can own my own stuff. And as I'm owning my own stuff, no other spirit can influence that stuff. It's only when I try to not own it that another spirit can influence it. Does that make sense? This is the beauty of how God designed you. When you own your own stuff, no other person can actually influence you. When I stay in the truth of my, my, in my, in my logic, when I, so when I'm doing that, so this is particularly important for you ladies. The man you're with didn't create your pain. Did he, in most cases? In most cases, your pain was created by your childhood experiences. Does that make sense? So if you're getting angry with the man you're with, how out of harmony with logic is that? Can you see the illogicalness of that? Like That is totally illogical to get angry with the man you're with when actually the anger was created by another man who might have passed or is in your childhood. Does that make sense? Lots of questions about that bit. Um, let's uh, maybe if we go to you first, Alex, and then if you just be careful of the video there. I just wanted to ask why you directed that at, at women, because um, oh, this because is definitely what I feel in our relationship. And the main reason why I've directed that at women is because many times, because of a woman's automatic ability to process emotionally better than a man, she also has a disadvantage with it in the sense that she often believes the emotion to be true. Do you understand? Now, now, so in other words, if I'm angry with my partner, I believe I have a right to be angry with my partner in that moment, right? Now often the man can see in that same moment that actually this is not angry with me, this is angry with your dad, right? But, but the woman in that say, because she's so in her emotions, can often not see the logical truth of that. Does that make sense? It's, it's exactly what's happening with Monique and I because I keep telling her, I'm not your father, I'm not your father. <laughs> yeah. And I can see at that point that she can't, she's not getting it. No, no. And, many, and, and this is the thing where logic can protect you as a woman uh, against hooking into spirits who would just go into a totally logical state, right? Now, by the way, emotion as a man can protect you. It's, a, it's the almost flip side for the man. Many men have huge difficulty getting into their emotions, right? right? Huge difficulty. Now, every time you don't get your emotions, you can easily be influenced by spirits, right? Spirits can influence you logically, unfortunately, to get out of your emotions. So for a man, you could say divine truth is logical and, let's state the full truth, emotional. So when the man's just verbalising, verbalising, verbalising the truth but not feeling any of it, can you see that's going to drive his woman nuts? <laughs> and understandably so because he is out of harmony with the divine truth on the matter because the divine truth is actually emotional as well as logical. The problem comes is that it's both 
And often what we do is we focus as a gender on one particular side or the other side and this is where we need to stop doing this. The men need to understand that they need help from their women often to understand and get into their emotion. Like to, to do what a woman does when with your emotion. Now many of you men have deep judgement about that. Right? You've, all your life is it, oh, women are too emotional, women are, you know, all those different programs that we men have about emotions. They're all sitting there judging our own emotion. How many of us feel as men, I'm a man, I don't get emotional? How many of you have actually said that in the past, you know, like to yourself, right? <laughs> I'm a man, so, you know, I don't. And, and many women have too, I'm not saying that the gender specific thing, but what I'm saying is that many men have a real focus on a pride even in never being emotional about the issue, always having logical solutions. That is our error, right? Because the divine truth is also emotional. Now, when I understand both of those, a spirit cannot now not influence me in either. So a spirit can't come along and say, oh, you know, and present us with a heap of logic that sounds really good that stops us from being emotional. Does that make sense? There's many spirits in the spirit world who dearly want you to stop being emotional right, on the natural love path. And they want you to stop being emotional. They think it's totally ludicrous. You're totally stupid being emotional. <laughs> is how they feel, right? That's, you, know, you know, with that condescension as well, you know, you're totally stupid. Like, and, and that's how they feel. That's how they feel inside of themselves, right? That's how they really feel. And they will connect to any person who feels it's stupid being emotional. And they'll influence you out of every emotion in that place. Conversely, there are many spirits who think, what's this logic crap? You know, like, there's no logic in the universe. There's no, you know, they're quite angry and upset about, you know, there being anything that's logical. They don't feel anything that's logical. And they feel like emotions, and they feel like causal emotions are your goal. They want you to be in your emotions 24-7, your unhealed emotions. That's what they want you to be in, just like they are. Do you understand? They want you to be in your terror when you're in your terror, in your shame when you're in your shame, in your you know, grief when you're in your grief, but not about causal matters. They want you just to be emotional 24-7. Because right? when you're emotional 24-7, you can be influenced 24-7 by the emotions that you're denying. Right? which are the causal emotions. So often what happens is that we stay in all these effect-based emotions or we stay in our logical brain, 24 by 7, which both of which is out of harmony with divine truth. Right? What we need to do is get in this space where we do know that truth is logical and emotional and we can actually feel these truths happening inside of us. Now, when a spirit comes along and says, oh, you know, AJ is responsible for your anger. You know, well, that's not very logical. Like, like AJ wasn't in my childhood that I can remember. You know, he wasn't my dad. Like, about the only person here in this entire room that can say oh, I'm responsible for their anger towards me is my own son. Nobody else can. Even Mary can't say it to, about me because I wasn't in her childhood. Does that make sense? So, so the truth is that I'm not responsible for any of your anger aside from my two sons. Right? So every time you're angry with me, whatever it's for, you're out of harmony with logic for a start, let alone emotion. Does that make sense to you? So, so whenever you're out of harmony with logic or emotion, that's when spirits can just connect with you. If I stay in it, I can go, okay, you know, AJ wasn't my father, so there's something going on here. That's all I really need to do, isn't it, in a way? I just need to say, oh, there's something going on here. And it's certainly not to do with AJ. It's got something to do with something else. And I need to work my way through that. With regard to this anger issue, though, can I just say a few more things about it? There are billions of spirits in the spirit world in rage. They're in rage with God, with religion, with science as well as in rage with their mums, their dads, their brothers, their sisters, right? just, just like we've had in our own past. right? Now, you know, as soon as I get into a state where I don't own my own stuff, 
and I get in a state where I want to blame you, and let's face it, a lot of the times we do want somebody else to blame, don't we? Like, we do. We want to say, you're to blame for my stuff. We want them to be to blame because that gets us out of dealing with our stuff, right? So we often do this. So when we're in this state, we're just inviting, like li literally there's a lineup of spirits behind you in that state. You know, you can take your pick, you know, between 100 here and 100 there, you know. And often they're in groups like that. There are literally millions of spirits in the spirit world who are in a rage with me personally. Right? So every time you get into a rage with me personally, you're going to invite a good proportion of those spirits to, as company with you. Right? Now, is that going to help you with your processing, do you think? <laughs> is it going to help you become at one with God? I don't think so. Right? Every time that happens, that's what's going on. Now, now, this is why, you know, when a public figure does something bad, thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people project certain emotion at them. Because in the spirit world, there's literally hundreds of thousands of spirits who are also upset with authority. And so you get someone who's a public figure, they just want to hammer them. Right? And they'll use you and your unhealed emotion to do that. Why not? If they can. Right? So, please think about this. Please think about this. In the Bible there's a good, another good verse on that issue with regard to the suit of armour. And it says, shod your feet with the good news of peace. And what that really means is, this. If you run towards peace, you will always be running in the right direction. If you run towards violence or anger, you're always going to be running in the wrong direction. So you need to protect where you're going to run. You need to stop making those steps in the wrong direction with regard to rage and just stop still. Stop still even. But it'd be better if you can walk towards peace and look at what's going on inside of you emotionally. Now I know many of you have had your hands up for a while but I, there's another issue I want to cover before we finish this and it's really important so I need to get on to it. One of the biggest protections that you have available to you is this thing of faith. Now faith I'd like to describe to you I'm going to do a presentation about faith in entirety at some point, but I just want to describe it briefly to you. Faith is when you know in your heart that something is true, but you have not yet experienced it. Does that make sense? So it's when you know in your heart that something is true, but you've not yet experienced it. Now, Faith is such an important emotion in dealing with spirits because spirits don't want you to have faith. Faith and hope are very interrelated in a way, aren't they? Like you can see that hope and faith are... Inter they're not interchangeable, they're different qualities but they are very interrelated. Now, if you have no faith, then let's be honest about it. Like we need to firstly be honest about what we do have and what we don't have. And if we have no faith that any of the things that you're being presented at the moment are true, then do you think you're ever going to do them? Of course you're not. Huh? And if you have no faith or a very little faith, what will happen is you'll be very easily influenced by people around you to do something different. Huh? So someone comes along and says, oh, I've got this device and it clears emotions. You'll go, oh, beauty, I'll try that. Because you don't have faith that you're actually a soul and that no device is going to help your soul. Right? And you don't have faith that actually God created your soul as a perfect piece of equipment already that doesn't need an additional plug-in to work. Right? The truth is, that is the truth, but we, if we don't have faith about that. One of the best things we can do in terms of combating spirit influence is to build our faith in God. 
How many times have you said to yourself in your emotional processing, I don't know if there's a God anyway? Or I don't know if there's a spirit world anyway. I don't know if any of this is true, really. Right? Now, often that's not the truth. See, often what the truth really is, is that in here you do know the truth when you recognise it, but because it's hard to do, we often want to get out of it. Right? Now, spirits work on that. So one of the things I do constantly, myself, is I'm constantly focusing on my faith. Right? My faith in terms of that if I keep going, everything is going to come good. Now, many of you have commented to me that you've seen big changes in me in the time that I've known you. Right? Now, that has only happened because I've got faith that those changes are going to happen. Because I, I don't know for certain, right, in turn, in, unless they happen. It's only when they actually happen that faith turns into reality, isn't it? Right? So there's been many times in my own progression where I've felt hopeless, just like there will be in yours. There's been many times in my own progression where I've felt like giving up, where I've wanted somebody to help and nobody's helped. And there's been many times in my own progression where I've pleaded for people to help and they haven't. Right? And when I've pleaded to God for help and I haven't seemingly got that because of, of different emotions that I've had, obviously. And each time I've not given up the faith that I'm going to get to the end of this. Does that make sense to you? And if you can do the same thing, that'll help you a lot through the hard times that you have. It'll help you a lot through the emotions, if you have the faith. But if you don't have faith, you know, this, this feeling inside of you that something's true even though you haven't yet experienced it, you won't feel very driven to do it when the, when the times get tough. Right? And that's the issue we face. You see, times do get tough because we've got all this spirit stuff going on us. And as I pointed out at the start of this discussion, we've got all this family stuff going on us, we've got all this friend stuff going on us, we've got all this spirit stuff going on us. And there's one thing we're going to need through all of that, and that is faith that we're going to be able to get through all of that and out the other end. And that, that this family stuff and the spirit stuff and the, and the friend stuff isn't going to crush us. That we're actually going to get through all of this. Right? And if we have that faith, that continues the process for us. We continue to deal with our stuff. As soon as we give up on faith, and in particular faith in God, that is the moment that you will actually give up doing this work as well. Now there are many people who have heard the truths that you have heard and who have given up. And I've used all sorts of excuses as to why. But one of the main things that they didn't have was faith that if they just kept going, everything would actually get better. Right? And we've got to learn to develop this quality of faith between, inside of us. And honestly, faith is not a quality that's easily developed in the spirit world. And in fact, you will read through, when you read through many of the Paget messages you will actually see that many of the spirits have a problem with faith. Right? And many of them actually say in the Paget messages that if they'd only developed faith while they were on earth, they would have had a much easier time in the spirit world. Faith in God, but also faith in the process of, you know, that some, there is something better in the future. That kind of faith. Faith, trust and hope are all very important qualities that we need to develop. Now many metaphysicians and many scientific people would argue with you that those three particular qualities are pointless. But they are actually, one of, one of the things God has designed is that these three qualities are some of the most important qualities to develop while you're on this planet. Because it's much more difficult to develop it on the planet than it is to develop it after you've passed. Because, can you see why? Well, let's look at it. 
Let's say you had never ever heard of any of these truths you've been presented with over the last tw two years or five years or whatever you've known me, right? You've never heard any of them and you passed into the spirit world. Can you imagine your own confusion, firstly, at where you are? Could you imagine that you have no idea about the life you were about to enter? Can you imagine arriving in a place where you don't know anything about anything? The only thing you know is that you've passed and even then you may not even be sure of that. You, can you imagine what that feels like? It's one of the most terrifying places to be. Right? Now can you imagine trying to get out of that place and develop faith? How hard is it going to be? You're going to be so focused on the emotion of where you are, what you're at, what's going on, confusion. Every, can you imagine how many years, how many spirits must remain in that place where they're not progressing, they're not getting out of place, they've got no idea how to get out of it, what to do, what things they must do to, to progress. They've got no idea about anything. Can you see that even just hearing about something and even not having faith in it is better than that? All right? But imagine if you actually have faith here on earth that your emotional processing work is what causes you to progress. And it's pretty hard to do here on earth, right? You know what it's like. Everyone around you projects at you and tells you you shouldn't be doing it and tells you you're an idiot for doing it and so forth. But if you have that faith and you just keep doing it and if you have faith in God and faith in love and faith in the fact that God is love and those kind of things, the instant you pass, do you think you're going to be afraid? Do you think you're going to worry about your future? Right? Of course we wouldn't, you see? Because we've, got, we've already got all of this faith of what we need to do and all this knowledge of what we need to do, but we also have this feeling inside of us that I know this is true. And you can go with that. And, and it's such a powerful thing. Really, it's a really powerful thing to have that. Imagine not having that. How do you develop it when you didn't have it? Now, many of the spirits with us in this room who are in a dark place are crying right now, right? Because they never had that. They never had any idea what the truth was like in the spirit world. They are actually, many of them, are locked up in places that are very dark and dingy and very, very dissatisfying and uncomfortable with no idea why they're there, how they got there, where they're going to go, what they're to do. And many of them connect to us because they've got no idea of what else to do. Right? And it all comes because they didn't have a developed faith either when they're on the earth. Right? So if you can develop this quality of faith, the Bible says it's actually like a large shield that, quen that stops the arrows of malicious people. Can you see how that works? The way it says it is it's a large shield that stops the arrows from the wicked one, it says. Right? Can you imagine how that works? If you've got faith, do you think somebody saying to you, oh, you're a stupid idiot for being on that path, is going to affect you? It's not going to affect you at all, is it? Is somebody saying to you, oh, you're just into a cult now, is that going to affect you? No, it's not going to affect you at all. It's just like, thud of that arrow into the shield, didn't affect me, thud of that arrow. <laughs> do you know what I mean? When somebody says, you know, you must be out of your mind. You, there must be something wrong with you to believe that AJ is Jesus. Now, you might not even believe that I am, right? But whether you believe or not, that arrow isn't going to penetrate you. It's going, not going to matter to you. Does that make sense? It's just going to hit, hit. Because you don't have to have faith in me. You need to have faith in God and love and truth. Those are the things you need to have faith in. And you're saying to yourself, I have faith in God, love and truth. I have faith in the fact that God wants me to live in this emotionally open place in full of love. Then all of these people who throw this stuff at you are just not going to have any effect on you at all. But you imagine you just put this shield of faith down for a moment and somebody shoots an arrow at you saying, you're a stupid idiot for believing that fool. Right? How's that going to affect you now if you've got no faith? Maybe I am a stupid idiot. Well, maybe AJ is a fool. You know? And maybe I am. But 
that doesn't affect your relationship with God, right? So, so at the end of the day, while I've got this faith there as a protection barrier, then, then all of these projections at me, which are like arrows coming into me, right, can all be repelled. And, and a spirit isn't going to hook into them anymore. Can you see that? A spirit's not going to come along and say, oh, all I've got to do is say to you, oh, AJ's a cult leader and half of you go into panic. So you look at how many people in the world go into panic when you talk about a cult. Like it doesn't worry me in the least. Like when I hear the term cult, I go, cult, how can there be a cult? Like at the end of the day, you've got to give away your own power to listen to somebody else as a cult leader, you know, who, who, who leads you into taking some Kool-Aid or something, right? <laughs> you've got to give away your own power, don't you? What am I encouraging you to do? Am I encouraging you to give away your own power? What am I encouraging you to do instead? I'm encouraging you to actually connect with how you feel, connect with your desires, connect with your feelings, and connect with God. Is that giving away your power? No. Right? And I'm saying I'm superfluous to that. You, you don't need me for that. That's what I'm also saying. So am I wanting to, to be, have power over your life? Now, if you had any faith in that, you would, like when somebody says it's cold, you say, what? It's fucking ludicrous. You know what I mean? It, it, it wouldn't even enter you. But for many people, you see how much it does. Like huge amounts, doesn't it? You've just got to say something's a cult. You know, the Catholic Church is a cult. By, by its own definition, actually, of a cult. Right? <laughs> So while I don't consider, I don't think there's any problem with the Catholic Church either in that regard, like they're allowed to be a cult, and, and they have a Pope, one leader who basically tells the rest of the world of the Catholic Church what to do. And a lot of it's not even written in the Bible that they say they actually follow. Right? This is the truth. I'm just telling you the truth for all of you Catholics in the audience, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this is the truth. Now, I'm not saying don't be a Catholic. What I'm saying is you can change the Catholic religion to being one of truth and love and hope, just like any other. Right? But let's, not, let's stop looking at this verbal stuff that goes on and letting it worry us. If we've got this shield of faith, God is love. I can have a connection with God. I am God's child. These are all basic truths. If those truths enter me emotionally, I will eventually have faith that I can connect to God and I can connect to truth and I can be in this place where I'm totally connected with myself emotionally. And if, when I'm in this place, what's going to happen is nobody outside of me is going to be able to negatively influence me in any way unless it's influenced to be more loving or it's influenced to be more truthful. Can you see that? Right. Now, now, there is many other ways that we can cope with spirit influence, but I wanted to raise these ones with you because my feelings are is that many of you are under quite severe attacks from spirits. Many of you get quite down about it, right, as well. And many of you, some, some of you don't notice when you're under attack from these spirits either. And what I wanted to do is give you a heads up today about what's going on and how to actually deal with the spirit influence and why it's actually occurring. A spirit cannot influence you without there being an open emotional hook that you have with them. Right? There is something going on that you're hooked to them and often it's not the thing that you think it is. Right? So just be aware of that. And all you need to do is pray about these things and you'll find the truth come to you of what the hooks really are about. And what I've done is listed some things that can protect you against their influence if you desire to be protected. And these things are not external protections in the sense that they are like a barrier, but rather they, they actually affect you inside of your soul. They cause your soul to be unaffected by these kind of external influences that the spirits will bring to bear. Now, I don't view spirits as your enemy. I view them as people that I love and want to help if they're in a, in a poor condition. And if they're a good condition, spirits that I want to have a relationship with, right? That's how I view them. I'm not afraid of them. But I'm actually saying to you that there are many spirits who are totally malevolent. They have no desire other than to harm you. Just like there are many people on earth who are also in the same state and who have very little desires other than to harm you. 
And these are the ways you can protect yourself against either of them. Whether they're on earth, in physical form, or whether there's somebody in the spirit world, in spirit form. Does that make sense to everyone? Now it must be getting pretty late. What's the time? Half past five. Okay, well I think what I'll do is terminate today. You're terminated. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> There's a few comments in that. Sorry, I didn't get that. Some publications you want to Oh, okay, yes, 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 sir. I was going to mention the books, which I'll do now. Now, you'll notice, you'll notice that the books I mention um, will be very similar to the ones I've already mentioned. <laughs> and the reason why is because they are one of some of the best possible ways to understand the interaction with spirits and people on earth. And the best series, the best series of books is Through the Mists. The Life Elysian. I can't even spell anything. And the gate of heaven. Now those, those three are written by a spirit who's, who's now a celestial spirit. Um, at the time they were written, he was not a celestial spirit except for the last, the last book. And um, they describe what he investigated as a spirit in the spirit world. And many of the things he investigated was the interrelationship between people on earth and how heavily they're influenced by spirits. And my suggestion is have a good read of those sections when you come across them because they're very powerful examples of how people on earth get influenced by spirits and how spirits also get pulled into influence to people on earth. Um, something else that's really interesting is 30 Years Among the Dead. If you haven't already read that. I, don't, I think it's amongst the dead. It's written by a doctor, a medical doctor who lived in the 30s and 20s and his wife was a medium. I think I've explained that before. They are both, by the way, now celestial spirits. And uh, when he wrote the book, he obviously was not aware of a lot of spiritual truths, but there, you can see the interrelationship between, in that book between emotions and how the spirits hooked into the emotions. My, when you read this, sometimes the emotions may not be that clear to you why the spirit hooked in and my suggestion is to really allow yourself, to, when you read it, to really feel what the emotion must have been for that particular spirit to connect to that particular person. And you'll find that it's very powerful to understand what's going on. That's a very good book. It's a natural love book, whereas these are more like divine love books, if you like. These are all on the CDs or on downloads on the website. Um, as well. Now, how many of you have actually read the Paget messages in full? Okay. All right. M many of you are missing out. Well, the Paget messages contain many, many examples of spirit influence and how to cope with it. Right? They also contain many of the truths that I've talked to you about maybe in a bit more rudimentary form than I've discussed them, but they still contain many of the truths. And when you read them, you'll feel quite influenced by them as you're reading them. So if you haven't begun to read the Paget messages, my suggestion is to take a bit of time out every day to give that a go. It is so powerful. Those of you that have started doing it, you could feel that influence, say, eh? in, in terms. Yeah, definitely a strong way to build your faith. Um, so um, now the, the one that's probably the best is the Book of Truths uh, that Joseph Babinski has done. Now my suggestion when you read that, there's a whole section of uh, messages. Sometimes, sometimes it's not easy to read things in the order of the date order. 
if you're, if you're interested in finding out some very interesting things about spirits, but you're not as interested in um, finding out about the divine truths as much, book number three of the True Gospel series is probably the book to read if you're interested in reading the Paget Messages. So um, it, the Paget Messages, by the way, when they were originally produced, they were produced um, two and a half thousand messages from spirits. They were then categorised and catalogued and then they were put into four different books, basically. And then they were translated into two different forms. And so now we have this, this called the Book of uh, Angelic Revelations and then there's the True Gospels. On the Divine Love uh, website, I've got TG or True Gospel 1, 2, 3 and 4. True Gospel number 3 actually contains a lot of messages from spirits who are not on the Divine Love path who talk to Paget about all different things, all different subjects. Very interesting subjects. Uh, right the way through from uh, metaphysical subjects right the way through to history subjects. And ma many of them are people that you have known in history, in fact, that came to Paget. So um, the Book of Truths is, a, is like a, a date ordered, a chronological order of all those messages, whereas the True Gospels um, are actually not chronological order. Uh, I think it's called the True Gospel of Jesus, um, whatever, volume one, two, three and four, right? And um, volume number three is the volume that is very much about how spirits interact with people on earth and so forth. You learn a lot of things, but you must be aware it's not in chronological order. So therefore, sometimes doesn't make chronological sense as to what's being dealt with. Book number four of the True Gospel is mostly about soulmate stuff. Uh, soulmate feelings, soulmate relationship and so forth. And book number one and two of the True Gospel is more about the divine truths that we try to present to Paget. Um, so they're not in chronological order though. Now there's one other book, um, it's called... Uh, a Wanderer in the Spirit Lands. Yeah. A Wanderer. I think it's the... Uh, how do you spell the Wanderer? Is it? In, yeah, whatever. The Spirit. Now, this is a natural love book, but it's actually um, a book about a man who was in fairly poor emotional condition when he left the planet. And... Um, I think that's the one I... No, no. no. Although that is a good one too. Um, the Wanderer in the Spirit Lands is a book about a man who he had a soul, he, he, he knew his soulmate while he was on earth, but she wouldn't have a relationship with him because of his condition. Right? She loved him, but she wouldn't have a relationship with him because of his condition. And he died. He passed. And uh, when he passed, obviously he passed into the hells. And the first two thirds of the book are about a lot of the spirit interactions and the interactions with people he had on earth that influenced him hugely in his progression. The, third, the, th the last third is about um, some um, Zoroastrian belief systems that he hooked up with in the spirit world afterwards, unfortunately. Um, but the first two thirds of the book, very powerful uh, in terms of seeing the influence that you can have on spirits around you and how you can influence their progression and how much they can influence yours. And also the types of uh, protection systems that can be given a person on earth if they're harmonious with love and truth. And so it's very good for those kind of things. So that's those. Well, there's many books that are claimed to be channeled through me. Um, that's fine, like they can make those claims. There are many spirits, there's, there's millions of spirits claiming to be me. Um, so, so of all people, I've probably got the most competition in terms of identity, right, <laughs> than most people. And, 
and there's many, there's many spirits who claim to be me and there's many books that claim to have been written by me and many of them haven't been and, uh, and that's okay, like it's up to um, the people to determine either way. It's not something that I have written, no. The, the, the ones that I've written were the Book of Truths, basically. I was in, involved in that process with Paget. So, um, uh, and perhaps if we still have the mic, because it's like, otherwise people don't hear. The, uh, the post-mortem journal, could you mention that while you're talking about books? And also, uh, if people want to get that and they haven't got it, they can email me and I can just send it to them. Yep, the post-mortem journal is the account, a spirit account of Lawrence of Arabia when he passed. Um, it, it's what Mary mentioned earlier, it's, um, it's quite a good account, but again, um, the first half to two thirds is about, is about his emotional processing work that he was encouraged to do, and then it starts getting onto some very philosophical arguments about the spirit world again that are not all that accurate, natural love past stuff. But the first two thirds, again, is very interesting in terms of how a person passes their spirit interactions. But there's not so much about the interaction between spirits and people on earth in it. Whereas with the, with the um, uh, Wander in the Spirit Lands and all of this series, there's a lot of interaction between people on earth and in the spirit world, which is very interesting to understand. Um, now, tomorrow, I'll be giving a presentation about possession. Uh, spirit possession and uh, and obsession, just to freak you out. <laughs> no, that's not true. No, it's just what I want to do is that many uh, and just as a brief intro to it, many people on the planet today notice a person who they consider to be a person quite developed in love, who claims themselves to be a guru or an avatar or something like that, right? not understanding how that person actually arrived in that condition. And tomorrow what I'm going to describe to you is, through some examples, is how people... Yep. Um, what was I talking about now? I can't remember. Oh yes, yes, that's right. And um, what, what I want to do tomorrow is talk to you about that because, because many people trust um, these, these people who have had these enlightenment experiences not understanding what the experience is all about and what's actually going on. And what I'm going to do tomorrow actually is use the autobiography of David Hawkins to actually illustrate what actually goes on with many of these people who go through these particular experiences. And then what we can do is you can start to recognise the difference between development, real development at the soul level, and overcloaking or possession, which is very, very different from each other. And it's very important that that is understood. Many of you have expressed to me how um, people who have said to be highly developed individuals have eventually gotten diseases or illnesses of some kind before they died. And in fact, there was one person even who believed himself to be God and got, a, I think it was diabetes, and, and died. And every one of these, uh, there are reasons for every one of these things go occurring. Because when you are actually developing within yourself without, action, without there being a spirit involved, that's when you only make the real development of the soul. And so many of these people who are highly admired on the planet for being developed people, when they pass into the spirit world, they're often very severely disappointed because they often arrive in the first fear condition uh, disconnected from the spirit they've been connected with all of their life and in a very, very traumatic state. So tomorrow what I'm going to do is describe some of those states to you so that you can understand the difference between personal development and developing by having a spirit overcloak you which is not really development at all, really. Anyway, so that's going to be our discussion tomorrow. Oh, um, one thing um, I just wanted to mention before, any of you who are mediums, who would be interested in doing some mediumship work tomorrow, I will be here from 10.30 in the morning to 12, and we can do some mediumship work together. We'll do some recordings of it um, as well, if you want. So, but I'm really interested in trying to help some spirits. There's a lot of spirits at the moment 
who are wanting to ask questions and we're not getting much of an opportunity to address those questions. So that's one of the reasons why I want to do this. Now I'm going to start doing this every fortnight as well so, so that um, we can have some regular uh, help for spirits uh, over the process. It's not going to be a process that all of you or any of you actually need to be involved in aside from the mediums themselves. If you want to hear about them, and we can uh, actually post the recordings of them on the net so that you can listen to them at another time so that it doesn't take up more of your time. But it's just something that we want to do so that we can help the spirits who are, are waiting for assistance. Um, there was another thing, Mary? Uh, this is an issue about um, parents and who have children here at the venue. Um, We've had quite a few discussions about these issues and I'm going to have one again and suggest some action actually. Um, basically, a um, lot of your kids come regularly and they know the general rule of the land that the processing rooms are for processing. Um, and lots of, well, basically our program isn't for kids. One day I really hope that we will have a program for, especially for kids. But children are always welcome in this room if they want to participate and listen. AJ and I love kids and, um, and Anna and Peter really love kids as well, the owners of the venue. And there has been some accommodation made for the kids when they first came. They couldn't be on the grass and Anna went with all the kids and talked to them about where they could go. They could go to the gazebo. There's actually um, quite a lot been, I'm a bit nervous talking about this. So what's the problem, darling? Like Basically today the kids were told again that they, they were found in the processing rooms making a lot of noise. They were asked to not be in the processing rooms. And then they were found in the processing rooms again and then there was resistance to leaving the processing rooms. Right. So that's a fairly major issue I feel for a lot of you parents about respect of the gift that is being given. This is a gift. Mm. There's no other way to look at it. Every single time we come here, we are given an amazing gift. And if your children aren't reflecting respect for that gift, there is an emotion for you guys. To be, to be frank with you, to be frank with you about the gift, the donations that we get would not even cover the hire of this place, let alone its operating expenses. Right, so it's quite a large gift that we're being given every single, every single time we come here. And, and I feel it is quite a large issue around love when it's pointed out that a gift is being given and the person is told that that's... And it's also a little point about emotionally processing because if there's children down there making a lot of noise while people are trying to progress, process, it's going to be hard for people to process down there. Now, one thing that we want to do in the future is actually have... Uh, a, like a little program that will enable, like that where children can learn about divine love in a much better environment than what we're currently learning about it. Um, the, the problem with it for us with that at the moment is that that requires time to develop and it's time that myself and Mary do, do not have personally to do, uh, to, to actually develop it. Now, some, some of you who are parents may feel like you could start developing some of that kind of a program but, but um, and our feelings are that would be fantastic um, but we personally with our emotional work that we're doing and the other things that we're currently doing can't do that at the moment and, uh, and because of that um, we understand that the children can get you know quite bored and tired and everything else and maybe that's something However. as parents to address as to why you feel like forcing your children to come along to a place where they're going to be bored and tired um, as well. Like there's something to consider. And bear in mind that many of us don't need to be here all the time. <laughs> and, and because we can hear about it on the net or we can do, you know, we, can, you know, we don't have to come. And I know there's a lovely energy here, but if you've got children here and you're feeling really under pressure with your children, Maybe it's better to look at the emotions involved with that as to what's going on for, for you with regard to the emotions with your children and why your children are not respecting the venue. Because rather than punishing them, we need to look at our yes, which own is creation. I, I wanted to address it here. And I, I actually feel like taking action on this issue, babe. This is the fourth 
So what action would you like to I take? feel that we need to say that children are not allowed to come to the venue until the parents deal with that emotion. I feel that's punishing the children for the parents' emotions. How else can we take an action that it loves the gift that we have? We ask the parents who have got the children not to come. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was trying to <laughs> make it the parents' issue. <laughs> well, um, one thing you'll notice me doing, and some of you have already been on the receiving end of this over the last month or two, is that from now on, instead of asking you things, I'm going to just take action. Right? And, and the truth is, that if, if you feel as a parent that you cannot um, look after your child and love your child in a manner that causes them to, to respect the environment that we're in, then as a parent you need to seriously consider why you're coming along. Does that make sense? Or so why the lessons that you're learning here are not being reflected in your children. Yeah. So my suggestion would be, um, if, a, if I had a child here, um, I'd probably be, well most of the time I'd probably be spending most of my time with the child. Um, and rather than sitting down and listening to the group, to be frank. Um, now I know a lot of times we come here to learn um, and I know this is going to be a pretty touchy subject for many of your par for the parents, but what we want to do is we want to still have children coming along but we want them to respect the property. And the only way that's going to happen is, as, is if as parents we respect the property. And also that we work through the emotions that causes us to not do that. And we work and we don't and also we have this viewpoint sometimes as parents that we want to do things ourselves and our children have to just bear the brunt of that decision that we have made for ourselves. And my feelings are that's not actually the case. My feelings are if my children if my children were running around and treating things unlovingly. I would be looking firstly at my own emotions and then secondly at why I want to bring my children to a place where they feel a bit bored and, and what's going on there inside of me. Why do I want to do that? And a lot of times you'll find that it's actually that you don't trust anybody else to look after your own children. There's issues like that. And there'll be issues like um, feeling that this is all too grown up for your children whereas I, find, I feel that many of the children actually understand what I'm saying better than many of the parents do. Um, so oh, I had a discussion recently with Sol about that, about how well he was, he, as Sol's like a young man who's, who enjoys moving in and out of the place, um, but you're getting a lot of the stuff really well. So it's like, and um, that's because Nina wants to learn as well. Also. I have to be direct and say this issue is with Sol. Okay, <laughs> yeah. no worries. So, yeah. just, uh, I was going to talk to him about that yeah. afterwards. So, um, my issue is that I feel I, I'm, we are being given a gift each time we come here. And You've got a bit of anger coming from you though, babe. Have I? Mm -hmm. What's the panic about? I feel really that the gift we are being given is not being respected repetitively and yeah. so that brings up something for me. Yeah. I feel a love for the gift that is given yeah. um, and I, I, I feel like I don't want to accept the gift if I know it's going to be disrespected. Yeah. 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 Okay. But that's not a justification for... Anger with. No, I'm very sorry. I, I obviously not owning enough of yeah. it. I'm very afraid because this is hard for me to be in truth around because... And also I think <laughs> afraid too because of you're worried about the damage that might get done to the property and then we won't be able to have the property and so forth. Yeah. A bit of that too. Mm. Yeah. So the, the, key, the key is for us to own our stuff, right? And to about, about different things and look at the emotions that are going on. For, for our children, a lot of the times, their lack of respect for somebody else's property is actually about us as parents when we feel we, we feel a lack of abundance in our own life. Do you know what I mean? And that lack of abundance in our own life is then impacted upon our, our children. So, so I certainly don't want to stop children from coming to the venue. That's the way I feel. 
but um, I would be perfectly happy to stop the parents who are <laughs> having a lack of respect for the venue to come, not to come to the venue for a while while they work through that emotion because that's more taking, I feel, taking, uh, putting the responsibility where it lay. Um, so, so if we can just bear those things in mind and if it continues, obviously we'll have to act rather than talk. Is that all right with you? That, and that's what I want to do from now on with every issue. Remember I had that talk recently, uh, five or so weeks ago, about the Divine Truth Foundation? Do you remember that I spoke a lot about um, how people could work with, with us in, in distributing the truth? And one of the things I mentioned there was the importance to have humility, so important to have humility, but also many of us have a very strong reaction to taking direction. Like, that's why a lot of us have never, wor never liked working for an employer, right? Because we have a big strong issue about taking direction. God wants you to take direction from God with regard to her laws. And what I'm going to try to help you work your way through with regard to the foundation is anyone who's involved in the foundation, I'm going to address this issue with them about taking direction. Because the truth is, if you can't take direction from myself, who happens at the moment to be the source of the information that you're receiving, then how are you ever going to take direction from somebody else who, who isn't the source of the information that you're receiving? You know, so so at, at some point, there has to be some respect for the source of the information. So what I'm saying to you is, if you can't work with me, you can certainly work by yourself on distributing divine truth. But if you want to work with me in the foundation on divine truth and with Mary when she feels in interested in doing that as well, then what's going to have to happen at some point is that you re respect the fact that you're going to need to, to be able to take direction. And that's not me trying to control you, that's just me saying to you, well hang on a sec, at some point we can get this organised or we can be, do this in a very haphazard way and who's going to be the person directing it? At some point I don't want to be that person but I'm perfectly happy to do it now so that every one of us learns that we're able to take direction. I take direction from, from God and eventually you'll be able to take direction from God directly too. And when we both do that, we'll be able to work together seamlessly. But until we both do that, at some point in time we're going to need to take direction if an organisation is set up. We need to take direction from each other not, and not you know, have all of these chiefs and no Indians. Does that make sense? And so that's an issue too that we want to, want to face in the future by being just honest about those things and working our way through it. So all of those people who have begun to show an interest in having the foundation or, or volunteering for the foundation to do some things, many of you will get addressed in the coming months about this issue of direction. And many of you you'll find quite confronted on the issue because I'll be quite specific about some things. And, uh, and the key is to work your way through those things. Remember that this is all about love in action, right? And it's all about the principles that we're learning in action. So in the parent principles, as parents, we need to address the emotions that cause our children to act how they act. Right? We need to address these emotions. We need to start feeling, that actually, that it's true that our children respond to our emotions. That's what they're acting upon. And we need to take responsibility for those emotions and notice what's going on. Out there, what's going on at the moment is there's quite a few children with all these different law of attraction events are going on that are all your law of attraction. And while that's out of sight, out of mind, you think, oh, I don't have a law of attraction on it. But in reality, it's going on right now. So you need to know what's going on out there. And even if that means you're going out every quarter of an hour to see what's going on for yourself as a parent. Do that. Allow yourself to do that so you know what's going on. Does that make sense? And let, start practising the love that you are start, starting to develop inside of your soul with others and with your own children. That's what it really means. How are you doing? <laughs> Is there any other 
Graham, you wanted to raise something? Have you? Do you want a mic up there, or I think? Would it be possible to do the same thing with the sanctuary that you're doing with the foundation with respect to taking direction? <laughs> you mean that I direct what's happening at the sanctuary? In the same way that you might be doing it with the foundation, yeah. Can I consider that? Most certainly. Yeah. Um, rather than give you an answer at the moment. Um, there's been reasons why I've uh, resisted that up until this point. One of the main reasons why I've resisted it is because I've found up until this point that I've been asked about certain issues regarding the sanctuary, but very, very little of what I've answered has actually ever been put into practice. And so if, if direction can't be taken from me just as a suggestion, then I feel it's going to be very, very difficult for people to take it from me under any other circumstance. Does that, does that make sense? Like, so, so there's been many times when I've been asked what to do or what's the right thing to do and given an answer, but those answers are not really very much been valued. And, uh, and as a result of that, um, different things have been done that are out of harmony with love, obviously. And, and so my feelings are, well, do the people involved really want to do things harmonious with love? And are they really wanting to deal with their emotion or not? Um, because the, what I see occurring quite a lot out there is people wanting to change the place to suit their emotional condition rather than actually deal with their emotional condition about the place. And, um, and so under those circumstances, it's very, very difficult for me to say, yes, I'll, I'll help direct those things going on when in reality already direction has been provided that hasn't been... Uh, hasn't been listened to very much, to be frank. Um, now, I'm perfectly happy for everyone involved in the sanctuary to not listen to me at all, <laughs> so that's fine. But, but for then me to be asked what to do, um, I would then have to look at whether the people involved really want me to be uh, giving that advice. And at the moment, Graham, you're the only person that's ever asked me for that advice. Um, so others have potentially, have sometimes occasionally asked me, but in many cases uh, the motive for asking me too is questionable. And in many cases the motive for asking me is to control somebody else's behaviour rather than actually do things harmonious with love or with God's truth. And so, you know, we, we, if we really want to address things at the sanctuary, we're going to have to start looking at the sanctuary as God's place. Like... God's location um, rather than our own and, uh, and I feel that many don't want to do that yet uh, for whatever, for various reasons and, uh, and if we don't want to do that then at some point we're not going to follow God's laws on the matter. Now I also know that God's going to correct everything because God's automatically correcting everything anyway. Um, so, and, and my focus isn't so much on the sanctuary, as you know. My focus is helping change people's hearts in whatever manner I can do that. Now, so a lot of the things that might go on in the sanctuary uh, that I'm asked about are practical things or practical matters. And um, my own personal interest in those practical matters isn't very high. Um, I have more personal interest in the soul condition on the, of the people who are on the sanctuary than on the practical matters that they're facing in terms of the sanctuary itself. And I feel that when the soul condition is addressed, then, then the practical matters will also be addressed. So many of you know that I've been trying to help you with your soul condition, but I also can feel quite a lot of resistance to some of that sometimes. And, uh, and so to me... What's happening at the sanctuary is really just a byproduct of what's happening at the soul level for all the people involved. And, uh, and so that's why I'd have to consider about whether I'd want to direct things on the sanctuary when I really feel my work is better done doing things like this uh, and Mary's workshops and things like that. Because um, I feel that would motivate people to do things lovingly on the sanctuary itself. And one of the issues that all of us face 
is do we really want to practice what we hear? That's a big issue, right? Because, uh, because a lot of the times we love hearing it. You know, our soul sings when we hear the truth and we love hearing it. But when it comes to the nitty gritties of practice in, in our daily life, that's when we really struggle. And the key is to pray a lot about putting it into practice because when, it's, when we're in putting it in practice, that's when we're growing. It's not when we're hearing it so much. You know, when you're hearing it, you'll have some little shifts here and there. But it's only when you're acting upon what you hear that you'll actually grow. And, uh, and it's so important to, to also act upon what you hear in every avenue. So the sanctuary, I feel, is sort of like an avenue where you can act upon what you hear and actually put it into practice. And, um, and if you do, I feel things will change quite rapidly there. Um, Many of you have heard now truth for two years or so, would that be the case? Like many of you were present when I first did a um, discussion with Peter two years ago, many of you before then of course, but, but for, for a vast majority of you, you would have first heard the truth then. And you felt that initial f feeling, didn't you, of it resonating with you. And I know many of you are struggling with the practice of the truth. And the key is to still have the faith and just to still keep working your way through those emotional issues. But don't, don't give up the practice of truth just because it's easy to give it up. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, it is, you see, with our emotional condition, it is easy to give up. And it's easy to stop doing what's the, what the loving thing is to do. And a lot of this is about learning how to love and learning how to forgive and learning how to be repentant and learning how to progress with your emotions and all of those kind of things and learning how to be honest and learning how to be truthful in, all, in every situation emotionally. And if, if I can keep doing that, then I will definitely always grow on the path. But if I, start, if I stop doing that and I get into my intellect and I get into practical things all the time, what will happen is, uh, when I say practical things, I mean I start doing all these things and a lot of times, to be frank, we often do things because we're frustrated with our emotional work. You know, so we've got to go and do something to make it better, you know, to make us feel less frustrated. If we can allow ourselves to understand we're frustrated, we're angry, go and deal with that emotionally, what will happen is we will progress quite rapidly and when we progress, things around us will change. So, so if things aren't changing, take stock, you know. Look at the life that you're creating, look at the surroundings. So at the sanctuary, if things aren't changing and you feel things are not going well, take stock of your own law of attraction, what's going on inside of your own soul, dealing with different emotions. Just allow yourself to look at that first. You'll notice that every conversation I've ever had about the sanctuary with you has always gone back to emotions. Someone said to me last week that they can't talk to me anymore because whenever they try to talk a business thing, I finish up talking about emotions. <laughs> and what I said in return is that if you don't understand that the business thing is the emotions, then all, already we're out of harmony with each other. Because that's what I've been talking to you about for two years. That the business is about the emotions. It is about the connection with God. It is about putting into practice love and all of that. That's the business. These side issues, which are sanctuary, you know, uh, foundation, giving the truth to the world, DVDs, all those, they're all side issues, which we certainly do need helpers for. We do need helpers to help us with all of those things. But what's the point in me getting a helper who basically wants to argue with me and fight with me about how it's done and, and then, when, and then not, they not put into practice their, their own things that they say they love to hear about. So, like, you've loved to hear the divine truth about gift giving, right? Well, I want to give the DVDs for free to the world, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? That's harmonious with truth, isn't it? So, but whenever I've said that to anybody, there's always the opposition. Oh, but it's not going to happen that fast. The truth is that whenever we don't do things harmonious with God's love and laws, it's going to happen much slower than when we do. I mean real development. You see, many of us in the past are so used to 
seeing things change because we've made them change with our bare hands. And what I'm suggesting to you is having to make things change with your bare hands all the time is because you don't want to deal with the emotional reason of why you've created the opposite in the first place. Right? And we've got to get out of this place of changing everything with our bare hands and into the place of changing everything with our soul first. Right? That's how everything happens in the spirit world. Soul first, everything practical later. Right? And to be honest with you, the most practical thing you can do is change your soul first. It's the most practical thing you can do, bear it, believe it or not. It might not look like it to you at the moment when nothing's changing in your soul, but, but the truth is that changing your soul changes everything. Right? So if nothing's changing around me, then my soul isn't changing. That's my feedback system. So let me self look at that feedback, Give, get that feedback. So I'm sorry that was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> the short question is, let me think about it. <laughs> the short answer is, the long answer is like, I feel many in the sanctuary need to look sincerely, a lot more sincerely at the emotions inside of them that are causing them to take the actions they're taking that are out of harmony with love of the environment or others or themselves. Jen, you want to just... Um, oh, anyone can leave at any time, by the way. Um, I was in receipt of a gift on behalf of everybody of a parcel of, of some 20, 25 books from Joseph Babinski. Yep. And I bought a card to thank him. Yep. Many people might not might like to take the opportunity to perhaps just express... Their thanks to Joseph? Thanks to Joseph because yep. without Joseph and his kindness and generosity in putting the books of truth together and sending out PDFs and, and now sending at his own cost this, these books that were given away free today that some of you received yep. um, for me... Sincere. Now you're gratitude. projecting, Jen. Can we just state the truth? Yeah. There's yeah. the card. If anybody would if like anyone to wants join to in, thank uh, Joseph. There's an opportunity to thank him uh, for Thanks, the book Sam. of truths that he's actually edited. Thanks, Jen. Look at the emotion as to why you want everyone to feel like you do. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your time. Sorry I took some extra time there. See you tomorrow.